Hey guys, welcome to my video on spinal cord lesion, and this is super high yield review. I'm going to start out by encouraging you to please subscribe and have notifications turned on. So let me talk about a CNS lesion. So you're reading a vignette, you see a fairly large area of motor paresis, meaning it's not strictly myotomal, and or a fairly large sensory deficit, so also not dermatomal. And so you're pretty sure now it's in the CNS, but how do you know it's in the spinal cord and not the brain? Firstly, if paresis is present, it's never contralateral to the lesion. So you can have ipsilateral paresis, bilateral paresis, but not really a contralateral paresis. Secondly, if ataxia is present, it's always a sensory ataxia. And in this video, I'm going to go over spinal cord lesions only. So there are five of them, tabus dorsalis and subacute combined degeneration, both uh, involve uh, parts outside of the spinal cord. So tabus dorsalis uh, always involves um, the dorsal root ganglia outside the spinal cord. And subacute combined degeneration, for the most part, only involves the spinal cord, but can sometimes affect the peripheral nerves and rarely the brain. So the rest of these are strictly spinal cord diseases. The next video will cover lesions that affect both the brain and the spinal cord. So tabus dorsalis is when tertiary syphilis causes demyelination of dorsal columns and dorsal roots. So this is a long-standing uh, infection. This person was infected with syphilis quite a while ago. And in general, when we read about ataxia, um, it may be difficult for us to tie it to a spinal cord lesion, especially a spinal cord lesion with a prior STD infection, uh, especially because we tend to associate ataxia with a cerebellar ataxia, which is caused by alcoholism. So be sure to be very careful about what you read, how you interpret signs, because there is a difference between sensory ataxia and cerebellar ataxia. And cerebellar ataxia is a type of ataxia caused by alcoholism, by if I mean deficiency. And that's a very different phenomenon than tabus dorsalis. So in tabus dorsalis, because of the, de the demyelination of the dorsal columns, you're going to have decreased sensation and or position sense of the joints. So when you say, you know, imagine walking around and you don't know where your foot is going or how you know far your leg is going when you're moving you put too much force or extend it too much and your position is way off you're going to end up with a twisted and banged up ankle joint and that's what the charcot's joint is charcot's joint is not a specific finding to tabus or salus charcot's joint aka um neuropathic joint is a finding in advanced uncontrolled diabetes mellitus. So Charcot's is a prominent but not specific finding to tabus dorsalis. The deep tendon reflexes are absent. So why are they absent in tabus dorsalis? Because the dorsal roots are demyelinated and the dorsal roots, if you remember, are a prominent part of the reflex arc. Romberg is going to be positive because you have the dorsal columns affected, you have the sensory ataxia. So I kind of squeezed in absent DTRs into tabs dorsalis so that it reads tabsent DTR syphilis, tabus dorsalis. Similar sounding diseases alcoholism by a cerebellar disease where you also have you have ataxia but see it's a cerebellar ataxia so be careful about how you read things and the other one that is subacute combined degeneration does affect the spinal cord but in a different way and by a different phenomenon so subacute combined degeneration is caused by mainly vitamin b12 deficiency and what happens is there's a gradual and patchy demyelination. So it's a demyelination that affects the dorsal column. So just like tabs dorsalis, it affects the dorsal column. However, it's more of a patchy demyelination. And also it 
subacute combined degeneration does not affect the dorsal roots. So the DTRs or deep tendon reflexes are for the most part intact. So you're going to have somebody who has a gradual loss of sensation and proprioception, vibration sense, there's going to be an ataxic gait, so they're going to be somewhat stumbling, unsteady, but Romberg's is not generally positive. Why? Because it is a patchy demyelination, and maybe in late advanced subacute combined degeneration, you may have it positive, but generally, it's not positive. Also uncommon in late is an effect of, on the lateral cortical spinal and spinal cerebellar tract. So if they get demyelinated, that's a late presentation. You're going to have signs specific to the lesions of those tracts. For example, you would have motor neuron signs in the lateral cortical spinal tract demyelination. Also uncommon, the brain. The brain is affected uncommonly and very late. So major causes, uh, underlying causes of subacute combined degeneration, pernicious anemia. So the number one cause of vitamin B12 deficiency is pernicious anemia. Celiac sprue, also fairly common. Post-gastric surgery, somewhat common. And alcoholism is a rare cause. So alcoholism really affects B1, B1 thiamine, which causes a cerebellar disease. It rarely, rarely causes a deficiency or a nutritional deficiency which would cause uh, B12 in, to the extent of causing subacute combined degeneration. The mnemonic I have made up is be calm and collected at school. So B12E, E vitamin is a E vitamin deficiency is a rare cause of subacute combined degeneration. So I put it with B12. Be calm and collect, co collected at school. So B column, so column for dorsal column, collected LCT, lateral cortical spinal tract, which is affected very late in presentation, and at school, so spinal cerebellar tract, again affected very late, very uncommon. Syringomyelia. Results from damage of the syrinx or neuroglial mass. So the traditional thing that we remember is loss of pain and temperature and a cape-like distribution. So what happens is in the most common cause of syringomyelia is Chiari 1 malformation. Syringomyelia can also be caused by a tumor, but Chiari 1 malformation is the most common cause. So what happens is the Chiari 1 malformation, which originates in the foramen magnum, comes downward, produce, protrudes downward, and damages the central cord of the spinal cord or the anterior white commissure of the spinothalamic tract. So the spinothalamic tract is important in relaying pain and temperature information to the brain. So most of the time, the vast majority of the time, the Chiari 1 malformation is going downwards and this mass effect only affects the spinal cord. Sometimes you may have something called a syringobulbia, but most of the time you have a syringomyelia which only affects the spinal cord. If the patient presents late, like he doesn't go and get help for this right away, this can expand, the, the damage can be extensive, and you can have other tracts of, of the spinal cord affected, and of course have more symptoms and signs added to the presentation. So um, now that cape-like distribution, that cape-like distribution is due to an extent of the damage from the cervical to, cervical spines to the, the level of the T1. So the cervical to the T1. And so I've come up with a little mnemonic, a cape till T1 from type 1 Arnold Chiari. So the cape like distribution is present if it extends from the cervical 
to the T1. And of course, type 1 Arnold Chiari is the most implicated cause of syringomyelia. Spinal poliomyelitis. So what spinal poliomyelitis is, is a fecal oral transmitted virus which replicates intestinally before entering the ganglia and causing destruction of anterior horn cells. It is a lower motor neuron presentation only. So cardinal uh, features of this, flaccid paralysis and um, and diminished deep tendon reflexes. So a good majority of poliomyelitis cases that present are spinal poliomyelitis. The, there is a great similarity between poliomyelitis and Guillain-Barre. So poliomyelitis versus Guillain-Barre. They're both similar in that they both involve distal weakness that ascends it somehow involves fecal oral root transmitted diseases. They both have abnormal CSF findings and they both have absent deep tendon reflexes. They can also both endanger respiration. But be careful. Pathophysiology, Guillain-Barre disease is an atypically rapid peripheral nervous system disease while polio is a CNS disorder. Guillain-Barre disease is inflammatory or post-infectious, uh, most commonly due to previous infection with Campylobacter jejuni, and poliovirus is the actual offending agent in poliomyelitis. Polio tends to be more asymmetric and closer to the trunk. So you may have this like with po a poliomyelitis afflicted patient, the ankle jerks are intact, but there's a difference between the reflex spining of the knee jerk. So you have um, a mildly absent knee jerk on one knee and um, a sort of semi-intact knee jerk in the other knee. CSF findings, so polio presents with an elevation of lymphocytes and slight elevation of protein whereas Guillain-Barre presents with elevated albumin, but a relatively normal lymphocyte count. So that's what we call albino, albuminocytologic dissociation, and that is a phenomenon seen in Guillain-Barre. So respiratory compromise less common in spinal polio. So respiratory compromise is seen in bulbar and spinal bulbar, bulbar polio, but not really in spinal polio. So we're talking about spinal polio here. Guillain-Barre commonly includes autonomic instability. So, you know, the heart rate and the, the blood pressure are uh, affected in Guillain-Barre disease. In polio, we are cons more concerned about irreversible paralysis. In Guillain-Barre, there's a specific treatment modality. So you have your plasmapheresis, or uh, immunoglobin administration. In polio, there is no treatment modality, but we of course have prophylaxis for polio. So to sum it up, Guillain-Barre is bilateral albumin raised and respiratory issues. So that's how I remember Guillain-Barre in comparison to spinal poliomyelitis. Lastly, I'm gonna talk about brown sequoia disease. So it's caused by hemisection of the cord, and you have ipsilateral and contralateral findings. So there's ipsilateral motor paresis. So at the level of the lesion, you're going to have LMN signs on the same side. Level of the lesion, LMN signs. Below the level of the lesion, you're going to have upper motor neuron signs. I would say that it's underneath the lesion for upper, but underneath People would think, you know, people get confused as to whether that's like below the spinal cord or what, what I'm talking about, but below the lesion, upper motor neuron signs. Ipsilateral loss of joint sensor position. So you have these three things on one side. 
On the contralateral side, you have loss of pain and temperature below the level of the lesion. So you've reached the end of my video. Um, like this video if you like it. Please subscribe and set notifications on by activating the bell.